we are experiencing a financial crisis. Now, maybe she doesn't want to have to acknowledge that. Maybe that's one of the reasons that nobody wants to say it's another financial crisis because it would make Yellen look even more foolish for having said that we would never have another one. In today's video, Peter Schiff, founder, CEO and global strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, gives a warning that the 2008 crisis was just the prelude to a larger sovereign debt crisis in the United States that may lead to a collapse of the US dollar. First of all, I want to go over some of the prepared remarks that Powell delivered. And again, these remarks are not part of the official statement that, that came out immediately uh, at two o'clock Eastern time when they announced the quarter point rate hike and they have this official you know, statement that comes out with the, the hike. And I already mentioned how the language was tweaked uh, in that. But then he has his uh, press conference and before he takes questions, he reads some more prepared remarks. And so these are the remarks that I want to start with. So first of all, one of the things he said with respect to the banking crisis is that the Fed is going to work to try to prevent stuff like this from happening in the future, right? So, hey, all this stuff is happening, and now the Fed is going to try to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, the Fed is the reason it's happening now. And in fact, when it happened in 2008, they told us that they would make sure it would never happen again. In fact, it was Janet Yellen who said we never have another financial crisis in her lifetime. And when she said that, I thought, well, maybe if she gets hit by a bus or something, that might be a true statement. But if she had a normal lifetime, I said, of course, she's going to see another one. And in fact, there's another one on her watch. She is the secretary of the Treasury and we are experiencing a financial crisis. Now, maybe she doesn't want to have to acknowledge that. Maybe that's one of the reasons that nobody wants to say it's another financial crisis, because it would make Yellen look even more foolish for having said that we would never have another one. But one of the reasons that they all told us we'd never have another crisis was because they claimed they fixed it in 2009, right? Now, of course, they caused the problem in 2008 that they claimed credit for fixing in 2009, right? They light the fire and then they say, oh, you see, we put it out. But they didn't put it out, right? They just poured gasoline on it and maybe it looked like it went out and then it blew up even bigger. And now they're making the same promise again. Oh, okay, the government's gonna fix this. We're gonna make sure this doesn't happen again. They still don't get it that the reason it did happen again was because of the government, because the underlying Fed policy and government guarantees that created the crisis the first time never went away because the Fed and the government misunderstood why we had the crisis in 2008. And so everything they did to supposedly prevent another one just guaranteed that another one would happen. And that's what I said from the beginning and, you know, of course, I got that right. Anyway, so then Powell again said that they want to make, or the Fed wants to make sure that the strong, resilient banking system, that's how he described it, but he wants to make sure that it's even stronger and more resilient. Well, again, I already said this. If the Fed wants the banks to be stronger and more resilient, the government's got to get out. The Fed's got to get out. We got to have normal interest rates. We can't have government guarantees. Look, why does everybody think that if you open up a bank account, the government should guarantee it? I mean, the government doesn't guarantee anything else. I mean, if you go and you buy a product, the government doesn't warranty it, right? I mean, the company will have its own warranty, but when you go out and you buy a car, it doesn't come with a government guarantee that it's, that it's not gonna break down. Like when you buy a new cell phone or a television set, there's no government guarantee there. You just take your chances, right? Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. So, you know, you do your homework, you buy from a reputable company. What's so special about banking? Why is it that I have some kind of right that if I put my money in a bank, the taxpayer's on the hook in case something goes wrong? The whole concept doesn't make any sense. It defies logic. It's got nothing to do with capitalism completely unconstitutional, yet nobody questions this. Oh, bank accounts have to be insured. Why? You know, I've talked about New Zealand a few times uh, on the podcast, but you know, one of the things that New Zealand did 
when they went through their uh, transformation in the 1980s because socialism bankrupted the country. One of the things they did is they eliminated their deposit insurance. They had it and they realized it was a bad thing and they got rid of it. So, you know, we didn't always have insured deposits and we can get rid of it. And we would have a stronger, far more resilient, far more stable banking system if we didn't have these guarantees. Again, imagine if every product we bought came with a government guarantee. Well, obviously, we wouldn't have nearly as good products because the companies wouldn't be under so much pressure to have high quality because they know, hey, the government's going to replace anything that breaks. So they're, they're not going to be uh, manufactured to the same degree as if there is no government guarantee. And, and the companies are responsible for fixing the stuff that breaks. Because if everything has got a government guarantee, then you don't even have to bother to shop around. Who cares, right? Well, you know, life has risks. There's no guarantee from anything. So you want to put your money in a bank, well, then you better make sure that that bank is solid. Don't just put your money in any old bank. Do some homework. Do your research. But there's no reason to do any homework. There's no reason to do any research because of the government. And of course, the banks know this, and so they act recklessly and irresponsibly. So uh, Powell is on a fool's mission if he thinks more government is going to make the banking system more resilient and sounder. No, it will achieve the opposite, which is what it's already done, which is why the banking system is so unsound and non-resilient, because it survives only based on a government crutch. A sound, resilient banking system wouldn't need the government crutch. It could stand on its own legs. Now, um, he also mentioned that the Fed was going to remain focused on the dual mandate to promote employment and price stability. He talked about how important price stability is and then said that he wants to make sure that we get inflation back down to 2%. Again, I've pointed this out. If prices go up 2% a year, they ain't stable. Stable prices stay the same. That's the definition of stability. Not going up every year, that's not stable. So the Fed says one thing, but does another because it doesn't really want stable prices. It wants prices to go up because it wants to create inflation. It just thinks that if they only have 2% per year inflation, that it's not that bad. Well, it adds up. And of course, their 2% is really 4 or 5%, and that's a lot of inflation. Now, he admitted in the prepared remarks that the economy had slowed considerably last year. So he admitted that. He talked about a slowdown in the housing market is in fixed income. He attributed that to the high, higher interest rates. But he did keep focusing on the fact that the labor market is still super strong. The unemployment rate near 50-year lows. Of course, we're not measuring it now the way we did 50 years ago. But of course, you know, he doesn't bring that up. He's talking about how we have this really strong labor market. And, and so, you know, price, high, rate, rate hikes can continue because the Fed is not worried about the employment part of its mandate. It's only worried about the price stability. And he admitted that inflation is still much too high. He admitted that in the prepared remarks and he reiterated that in the Q&A. He did also say in the prepared remarks that reducing inflation will require, according to him, below trend growth and some softening in the labor market, right? So not a big deal, just a little bit of softening. Anyway, oh, and he said that there's still a long way to go uh, in bringing inflation down to 2%, but that long-term inflation expectations remain well anchored. And for a lot of people, they are, if you look at the bond market, but the bond market's got it wrong. I mean, they, have, they still believe that the Fed is going to bring down inflation, although they don't think the Fed is going to bring down inflation. They think the Fed is going to bring down the economy, and they think that the economy crashing will bring down inflation. See, they're half right. The rate hikes will crush the economy and crush the banks and cause a huge recession, but that huge recession won't lead to lower inflation the way bond investors think. No, it's going to be the catalyst to spark even higher inflation. That's what nobody thinks. And that's you know where there's a real opportunity here to make a ton of money because the consensus is completely wrong on inflation and how it's going to play out 
in the bond markets, in the foreign exchange markets, in the precious metals markets. And so there's the opportunity for the people who do get it right uh, to make a lot of money at the expense of the people who have it completely wrong. But anyway, let me go to the Q&As because that's really where you get the important uh, nuggets. And I think it was the Q&As that caused the, the sell-off in the stock market and they're likely to cause some additional decline. So one of the questions, the very first question he got was, should we read today's tweaking of the language and this hike as a pause, right? Is the Fed now pausing after this hike? And Powell basically said, no, we're, this is not a pause. Don't confuse it with a pause. We have not decided yet. We don't know what we're going to do at our next meeting. We may hike rates or we may not. It just depends on the data, right? They're back to data dependent. So that immediately threw some cold water on the idea that the Fed would admit, yeah, we're going to take a step back and we're going to assess. So we've kind of paused. They're like, no, no, no. I mean, the next meeting is live. We could hike. We, we just haven't made up our mind yet. We need to see, you know, the data. We get the jobs data on Friday. The ADP that came out today, uh, you know, which I'm not even discussing, but that was better than estimates. But I want to focus mainly on, you know, uh, exclusively rather on, on this stuff. But, you know, that we get a jobs report on Friday. I'll talk about that probably on Sunday night when I do the next uh, podcast. But the Fed's going to be data dependent, right? He was asked if he still forecast a mild recession. And initially, he didn't really answer the question, but then he got it again later. And he said that he still believed that a slowdown was more likely than what he believed would hoped, what he hoped would be a mild recession. Now, that's different than what he said in January to the fake Zelensky on that prank call that I talked about on my last podcast, he told Zelensky in January that a recession was equally likely to a slowdown. Now he's saying it's less likely to Congress. Why? The situation is decisively worse now than it was in January before the financial crisis started, before all these banks started you know, failing uh, one after another. How can Powell now think the odds of a recession are slower or slimmer than they were in January. I mean, if they were equal in January, it's obviously a greater probability now. But again, he was willing to be more honest with the fake Zelensky than he was with these reporters when he knows that all of America is listening to what he says. So he he still wants to you know play his cards close to the vest, although he didn't say that if we had a recession, it would be mild. He said he hoped it would be mild. So he didn't say, I think it will be mild. He said, I hope. Well, hoping and thinking are two very different things. You know, there's a lot of things that people hope for, right? They don't necessarily get them. So hoping for a mild recession is very different than forecasting a mild recession. So they've moved from forecasting it to just hope it a prayer. Well, the prayers are not going to be answered. 